thanks for the opportunity and thanks for coming by everyone and um yeah so today i'm gonna be talking about some um old and new analyst results for navia stokes i think it's a pretty classical subject in the literature at least in the navia stokes literature and um i think it's also a good topic for the analysis seminar um, so let me just start with the equation. So we had a Navier-Stokes system where we first write the conservation of momentum, which starts as a parabolic system, plus the nonlinear term and the gradient of pressure function equal to some forcing in our setting. So this is the conservation of momentum. Um, we're going to be holding over a domain omega in space-time. And we have this incompressibility condition that divergence of u is zero again in, in domain omega. And I'm going to um, close the system with, with a boundary condition that on the boundary well, we'll be working with a domain with boundary, and on the boundary, I'll impose this no sleep condition that u vanishes on the boundary. And we'll, imp we'll supplement the system at time t equals zero with an initial datum. And instead of t zero, let me just put zero. Okay. Um, so for most parts of the talk uh, today, I'll be talking about a specific domain with boundary, um, the nicest domain with boundary that one can ask for, the half space. So let me put that on the board as well. Omega is going to be um, x to xd in rd, where xd is positive. So on the boundary we have the real line. Okay. Well. Um, so let me also put the main term on the board. Um, so on the half space we show that when you start with an analytic forcing, the exterior forcing F, if you take it on analytic space time, space time analytic, and if you start with an initial theta u naught, which has some sobel f regularity um, with some sobel f regularity, well, to be accurate. Um, I would want to have u not to be in h zero one intersection h four, and um, so on this domain under this forcing in the initial data, we show that the solution to this Cauchy problem becomes space time analytic. Um, over, over our domain for a short time of interval, so on omega cross zero capital T for some T positive, most probably very short, um, and with an analyticity radius uniform all the way to the boundary. Okay. Um, so this is a joint work with uh, my PhD supervisor Igor Kukavika and one of his former students, Vula Recall, which came out around um, last year around this time. All right, um, so we'll be focusing on this. Okay. May I ask you one thing? So F, uh, you're assuming is, is, is divergence free or you're not assuming anything? Um, no, no divergence-free condition on F. 
But for UNAT, yes. So for UNAT, we want the divergence-free yeah, condition mm -hmm. and compatible the conditions on the boundary, meaning we want UNAT to vanish on the boundary and up to some degree uh -huh. with the derivatives. Um, and under this, uh, the solution, the strong solution, the Navier-Stokes becomes space-time monolithic. Um, the same result is also true for the Gevre classes when f is Gevre regular. So if you start with the data, um, sorry, forcing f instead of analytic, uh, which fails to be analytic, but maybe you still have nice control on the on the derivatives. Like instead of bounding the, I'll just be you now very. Um, in some norm, if you bound the derivatives of f with some constant, which would become your analysis radius uh, times um, factorial of the order of the derivative, then we would say that we have an isonalytic function. But for classes of functions which satisfies this estimate where f is a parameter greater than or equal to 1, uh, this still forms a nice class. We uh, refer this class, we denote it by the Gevre class with index s, and when this index s is equal to 1, we exactly get the um, real analytic class. So this was just a vague description of Gevre classes. Anyway, so if you start with a Gevre regular function, then we would still get the same um, conclusion for solution. It becomes Gevre regular with the same index. When you're at h zero one, you have this It's yeah, half space. So you have the new space. So H4 is like H4 locally? Or is it? Um, no, H4 globally. I'm, yeah, maybe locally. Local H4 might also work, but I think, um, well, this is just to, just to ensure some smallness on the lower order derivatives. And it's just be something we transport from the classical results. I'm pretty sure it's for H4, but yeah, I, I would check again for um, some local integrability. Okay, um, so um, so in Altus' results, as I said, it's a pretty classical subject in this literature. Um, so it actually it goes as far back as the regularity of weak solutions. So in like in a famous theorem by um, in that famous paper by Seren from 62, where he showed that the uh, um, weak solutions of Navier-Stokes were specially smooth. So if you start with a weak solution u in the class L2, in infinity L2, with the gradient control again L2, L2 in spacetime, L2 xt, then he shows that the solutions becomes smooth in the special variable. Um, so this class covers uh, basically the kiselev legezhenskaya type weak solutions and um, so whenever we have uniqueness. And he further poses that the more should be true for this conclusion uh, that he expects to get analyticity for this type of solutions. And then later on this is actually shown by Charles Kehan around a couple years later. Uh, under the same conditions, they show that U is actually analytic in space. Um, and in, again, around the same time, Masuda um, has similar results. He, um, so for this conclusion, certain imposes a conservative <coughs> forcing. And this could be, like in Kahane results later on, it could be uh, switched to a real analytic um, forcing as well. And Masuda, uh, what he does is that he starts with a forcing, uh, space-time analytic. And um, which can be extended holomorphically onto um, homomorphic extension. So if you're working in the domain omega, let's say, and if we check the cylinder, we want to 
extend up holomorphically onto omega cross G, where G is a domain and the complex set uh, symmetric along the axis, which includes this interval. And then he shows that U, the solution to the Cauchy problem, becomes um, holomorphic again in the same domain, or we could prefer to write space-time monolithic with a holomorphic extension. Um, a corollary of this result is that he gets unicontinuation result for this. So if a flow, so the uh, velocity vector u, if a flow is at rest uh, at some positive time t naught, then this basically implies that it should be at rest for like for all times backward and forward. U should be zero everywhere. And um, so, so I have a question though. Uh, so if you know that it's it's smooth, mm -hmm. do these results tell you it's analytic? Um, so in Charles Cohen's result, he basically uses the iterations obtained by Serin. So, so it is enough to know. It is, yeah, he doesn't add anything more. But for this, it's, it's basically a different method. What they do, <coughs> this is a pretty common method actually in order to establish analyticity. Uh, you complexify the space in the time variable yeah. and then you could either um, consider the ut as a Banach valued function in that complex setting and then in some way write um, an elliptic system of n plus two variables for u and omega and or you could just follow the Galerkin approximation structure with the complexified setting. Um, so all these results, they cover the interior analyticity for solutions. Um, one result that's specifically important for global analyticity or like analyticity all the way to the boundary is by Komatsu, which comes around maybe a decade later. He shows that the, uh, he basically shows the global analyticity of solutions. On the on the cylinder again with an analyticity radius uh, that is uniform all the way to the boundary, assuming that uh, u and p is smooth to start with. And um, again, similarly, Giga has some um, analyticity results uh, concerning the global behavior and analyticity at a boundary. Like if you start with an analytic forcing, and if your boundary is like analytic at a point. Uh, under what conditions we can get the analyticity of solution at that boundary point type of results and he establishes it under the uh, analyticity of the domain and that of F, the forcing. Um, well, one more result that I uh, should be mentioning is by Foyash and Tamam. In the case of no boundaries, uh, they do establish analyticity, uh, which basically just by using the Fourier expansion and the decay of Fourier coefficients. And the nice thing about the periodic structure is that they could basically just use the L2 type energy estimates without uh, going into this complexified setting or just uh, any other structure. Um, so I should add that here too by Foyash and Tanon with the periodic setting. Okay, well, um, one nice application of analyticity results is actually it comes in, um, it comes very <laughs> nicely applicable for zero viscosity problem. So in the case of, so here the viscosity is hidden. Usually we put a viscosity co coefficient in front of the Laplacian, but if it's going to be fixed, we could very well scale it to one. But if you were to take let's say a limit down to zero. Um, in that case, you better include it there. Um, and um, so in the case of no boundaries, this system converges comfortably or somewhat nicely to Euler, but in the, uh, in the existence of boundary, one would expect a boundary layer. And then away from the boundary layer, uh, you would have nice convergence to Euler, 
but around the boundary layer, uh, whose thickness uh, might be related to viscosity or some several conditions or your initial data, uh, and if you're analytic, the analytics to reduce. Um, anyways, um, in the boundary layer, you would expect to see some frontal type behavior, which is not well posed in the Sobolev spaces. So uh, one common uh, thing to do is to study that problem in the analytic setting with the analytic initial data. Uh, so there are, again, maybe I would include them here, classic result by San Martino and Kaflish. Um, I think late 90s, um, studying that problem on the half space with analytic initial data. And recently, um, there is a new result on that area by Xiao Wang, uh, Yu Shi Wang, and Shi Fei uh, Jiang. Again, using the analytic setting. So what did Kaffish, I mean, I remember seeing this paper like Kaffish, but I don't remember what he did. So what, what did they do? Um, basically, well, theirs is even more complicated. They construct solutions mm -hmm. in uh, two consecutive papers. First, they construct the solutions, and then uh, and then they prove um, the the behavior of the convergence or the thickness of. They try to observe the thickness of the boundary layer. Right there, yeah. Um, uh, so what did, what did he say about the analyticity? There was some discussion about that. Yeah, so analyticity, if you s they start with the analytic initial data as well. Right. So the solution uh, stays analytic and um, maybe for a longer time than this, it might still be strictly smaller than the time of existence. Um, and, um, and, and the, so the so thickness of the boundary layer, um, they could, um, they, they measure it with some, uh, like at what level the viscosity would give us uh, a good bound on the, on the thickness of another uh, boundary layer. I'm not sure if I can like <laughs> um, talk more about the construction. <laughs> Mm, yeah. Okay, so now um, I want to go back to our theorem and then and then uh, talk about our analyticity norm. So, uh, can I, can you, so by saying that this uh, space-time analytic, do you also assume it has a holomorphic extension? No. Okay. Um, no, just space-time analytic in the in the real variables. Um, so. To start with, we take advantage of the domain. We are on the half space, so and we're going to be using the special end time differential operators. For special differential operators, instead of the gradient, we split it into the tangential and the normal components, um, and and then basically um, define an analyticity norm. So I'm going to be denoting it with phi sub t. And we basically sum up uh, Taylor-like coefficients. Um, so we have our vector, our velocity u. We apply some space and time differential operators. So we'll have dt and um, the derivative in the normal direction, del sub d and derivative in the tangential direction, their bar. Uh, let's put orders i, j, k. And then we multiply it with a t prefactor, t to some power a. Take the space-time L2 norm of this, um, of this vector, and then multiply it with an analyticity radius and, and a factorial. Um, so for the analyticity radius again, we have apparently three directions, so we'll be having three types of radii. For time direction, I denote it with epsilon. For normal direction, <coughs> epsilon tilde. And for um, tangential direction, with epsilon bar. Again, with the corresponding powers, i, j, k. 
and then multiply it with a factorial. Um, we'll be summing these up in a shifted fashion, starting from two, um, three. And then for lower orders, we basically just sum up the derivatives. ETI, um, del sub D, J, del bar K, U. OK. All right. Um, so here this we shifted, and the, the factorial component becomes basically let me denote it by sub n. We'll have m cubed divided by n factorial. And the power a um, for the t prefactor is going to be also uh, minding the shift, the sum of the um, derivatives minus 3. Okay. Um, so I have like two remarks or observations on this norm. Well, first of all, I split it into two parts. Let's just denote you know, that the uh, domain sum by phi bar and for the lower part by phi naught of u. Okay, so if you look at the lower part, phi naught, it is basically um, the H2 space-time norm of u. Um, so under some conditions, we could put some restrictions on this and keep it small. Um, and further, well, we're shifting, and then we have this prefactor. But <coughs> if we if we can just bound this uh, phi of t for for some positive term t, this actually gives us um, real analyticity of u in in real time. We're we're basically controlling all the orders of derivatives. Okay, um, but how do we um, achieve boundedness of phi sub t? Well, our goal is, well, let me try to pull the board. <laughs> okay, this wasn't so hard. <laughs> Not super heavy. Um, so basically our goal is is to have some sort of a control on this analyticity norm. And then we basically want to have an estimate of this type. If we can control phi sub t with, uh, with a constant that depends on initial data, plus uh, some analyticity norm of f could be shifted, but basically it's going to um, contain derivatives of all orders. And we'll in a, in a sound fashion, plus um, a finite combination like up to five or eight of terms of this form <coughs> with some t prefactor to some positive power and uh, products of the lower part and the main sum. So here alpha j is positive, and then beta j's are going to be in between 0, 2. Um, so if we have this sort of a control on phi sub t, uh, we can actually use a standard barrier type argument. And then we can basically show that phi sub t of u, it's, it can actually be controlled by the by the first part, first two parts. So you have like a list where you say that this phi naught beta j and phi bar two minus beta j. Phi naught is the um, finite sum of the uh, finite sum of the norm, finite part of the norm, second part, the analytic norm, uh -huh. and phi bar is the main sum. 
Or we could just, well, five, five bar is big enough, so we could basically just skip the sum and keep it as phi. Yeah, but I'm missing what the subscript beta j is. Oh, those are, they are positive numbers, sorry. Ah, powers, powers, powers. Yeah, 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 just powers. Okay, okay. Yeah, so basically we have so either, <laughs> either p to some power times phi squared yeah, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or like, some, some combination. Yeah, so yes, no, I should have yeah, made it clear. So what we want to have is this sort of a control on the analyticity norm. Um, and, um, okay, one more remark on, or note on the smallness of phi naught. So if we have uh, our initial data in this space with, okay, we put uh, analyticity construct uh, on f, but if f also has some sobel of control, like um, L infinity H3 and like W1 in infinity in time, H1 in space, W2 infinity in time, H2 in space. Um, then, uh, using the local existence and uniqueness or regularity theory, we could show that the H2 norm of uh, of the solution um, stays bounded by t to power one half times a constant c or c star that depends on u naught and f. Um, these norms of u naught and f. So basically, we can um, keep phi naught small um, if, like, if we stay around, if we stay around zero. So this could be um, found in Solonikov's papers. Um, okay. So now let me uh, go through the sketch, uh, but maybe I should. Um, write down the theorem once again formally. <laughs> so basically, uh, well, for the sake of computations, we focus on <coughs> the dimension two and three, but for higher dimensions, it's basically the same uh, method and same computation. Uh, just for the sake of fixing the Galliard and Nuremberg uh, powers. <laughs> okay, for dimension two and three, there exists um, positive numbers are analytic radii epsilon, epsilon tilde, and epsilon bar in the interval 0, 1, such that if u naught is in, again, in a space with some compatibility assumptions that it is incompressible, then it vanishes on the boundary and some, again, compatibility assumptions on the boundary and a real analytic F, space-time analytic forcing uh, with these Sobolev R2, <laughs> okay, plus, plus some Sobolev regularity. Um, Am I missing anything? No. There exists um, a positive time t star such that the unique solution to the Cauchy problem, uh, u, um, becomes real analytic, or we basically have the phi norm of u controlled by phi naught plus um, some analytic sum of f um, and that's and that's it for all times uh, till we hit t star Okay, so, um, so... Can you do something more in two dimensions? Um, no, in terms of time of existence? Yeah. No, it's again small. 
Uh, but uh, you have look, there are global solutions, right? There are yeah, yeah, there are global solutions. There are global analytic solutions if you start with an analytic um, initial data. Yes. I mean, that's, so, so that's already what's what's established. That? So what we have here is that um, besides having space time and uh, starting with the Sobolev uh, regular function only, yeah. that we actually have uh, full control of radius uh, all, the, all the way to the boundary, everywhere. Oh, I see. So the, the radius yeah, doesn't get shrinked down shrink when we get when we get to the real line. So, but if I just if I don't ask for that, I just ask for uh, the existence of analytic solutions, and that's no or Yes, I mean under uh, similar so assumptions. So then, can you quantify how the <coughs> are in terms of U zero, or does it depend on F as well? Say it again. Sorry. Can you quantify what U star is based on? Oh well, T star is basically given by the classical uh, classical result. Well, yeah, through some definitely through these norms. Um, yeah. So, so the main point is that you have this uniform control of the electricity all the way down to the all the way down to the boundary. Yes. Also, I think um, we do have a direct method of showing that instead of. Um, so I'll be sketching the method as well. Um, like instead of complexifying or just using the Galarkin approximations, uh, we basically just uh, just by brute force check the sum. Um, and for that, um, well, we first check uh, what happens in the stock system. So this part, um, let me also put the stock system. So we basically consider uh, this system now with the, the same set of equations minus the nonlinear term um, and the incompressibility and no solid boundary conditions, the initial data, uh, U0. So the last two authors um, Igor and Vlad um, checked um, the analyticity norm of solutions to the Stokes system and they were able to, like, uh, studying the same norm, they were able to get the same control. So here I explicitly want to write down what uh, mt of f is, it basically has the same structure of phi, um, but we split it into three parts. First, just um, have the summation of all the time-only derivatives with the T prefactor and um, shifted, um, it's going to be a shifted sum, but with the, uh, the radius in the time direction and the factorial. And then um, summation of terms with no normal uh, derivative. So basically we'll have time and the tangential operators hitting f, t prefactor, epsilon i, epsilon bar, k plus 2, some gain. And, and lastly, uh, the mixed terms. It's probably just getting a little confusing, but we have all the terms where j is not 0. So there, for the Stokes system, we have some restrictions. I mean, in general, we have some restrictions on this uh, radii. Basically, as one would expect, um, in the normal direction, 
we have the smallest radius and then the tangential one and then the time uh, radius oops sorry epsilon with some um, correlation or with with the uh, with the time of our cylinder hmm. but um, for now we have since we already I mean Besides this calculations, computation-wise, we still need t to be small to control the small part, the finite knot part. Uh, and when we have that condition on t, uh, we can basically just import all these restrictions or assumptions on Donald Tester radius for, for Navier Stokes. And, um, and then what we do, the well, basically, um, we write the Navier-Stokes equation as a forced Stokes system um, and then we would have <coughs> phi of u being controlled by phi naught plus the analtistic norm of f and analtistic norm of this product uh, or three types of products uh, sorry summations on this product term which I'll be coming next I do want to talk about so if I understand correctly the, the splitting is primarily useful for later estimates it's not the, in principle or, or the first term seems to contain Oh, so you're not including certain terms where the index is zero? Like, what's the, 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 the splitting of normal and tangential? So, just certain derivatives are not present in, in, in the. Oh, um, okay. Well, basically, um, it comes that way due to, due to the procedure, which I'll be talking next. Um, and then it Yes, definitely. Also for Navier Stokes, it makes more sense to keep them different so that we could just, um, we could, like, for example, if you just have time only operators hitting your nonlinear term, um, is, it's a lot easier than having um, the, the mixed derivatives hitting the product. And, um, well, I Thing just to it definitely makes things more convenient besides that yeah it doesn't have I think a further purpose <laughs> okay let me just um, well there I have the definition so maybe I just erase this part oh. Okay, so the key, um, the key idea that makes things work or that makes us to get that control is basically the um, derivative reduction estimates. What do I mean by this? So this is a suitably chosen form of the analyticity norm where uh, if we consider those expressions inside the L2 norm, well, basically, if we can just shift around the order of derivatives, or if we could just reduce uh, in the normal direction and get extra derivatives in the other directions, that would definitely help us um, getting the estimates close or just making the sum controlled by the smaller parts. 
And um, so the main idea was to uh, was to be able to trade off the derivatives. And I think it's best seen for the heat equation. So I'm gonna just try to show um, how we can do the derivative reduction. So if we have this nonlinear heat equation with no slip boundary condition again and the initial data um, so if we check uh, what equation uh, our expression in the norm satisfies like the Laplacian of this sort of expressions well, luckily Laplacian commutes with all the uh, operators here and then we get Laplacian of u okay, okay. Uh, this operator applied to Laplacian of u and what is that? we get one extra time derivative um, the rest is the same of u minus uh, the same operator applied to f okay so now we want to use the h2 regularity uh, for Poisson equation on the half space so basically if I look at the Poisson on the half space and if u vanishes on the boundary um, we can control more derivatives of u than uh, that of g and if u does not vanish on the boundary we get a trace term um, and then we lift it inside and interpolate and we get um, one tangential derivative in homogeneous h1 norm meaning one derivative of this plus a lower order term um, L2 so if I apply this estimate on on this I basically get or if I just check the L2 norm of um, this expression which I can basically if j is greater than or equal to 2 reduce two normal derivatives and then apply this estimate what do we get? we get the, uh, the f part or g part which is these two terms in L2 norm so basically we have two less derivatives and one more time um, on u plus f I'm applying it with j minus 2 um, and um, plus these two extra sums where we get one tangential and one full derivative but at the end of the day even if I apply that um, I'm reducing one normal derivative or maybe less two normal derivatives uh, plus two tangential derivatives in the worst case scenario which we can afford better uh, due to these restrictions on the radius um, so these two terms applied on that expression so this is just um, for j greater than or equal to 2 when we have at least two normal um, derivatives but this idea basically it works for uh, the time and it, it works for j0 and k greater than or equal to case as well and for time only derivatives basically just the energy estimate it earns on one derivative so I think I have it somewhere here hidden all the yeah derivative reductions sub d is a normal direction 
bar is tangential. Bar is tangential. So basically, uh, if we just recall the analyticity norm, the full sum, we split it into parts where um, if j is greater than or equal to 2, we use this estimate and reduce some derivatives or trade off uh, from normal to tangential. And then if j is, let's say, lower order, then and k is greater than or equal to 2, we do the same trick in the tangential component. If j and k is 0, uh, if they both are zero, then we basically use the uh, L2 energy estimate on t to some power in dt i in the order of um, i derivatives, and then have one less derivative in the tangential direct, um, in the time direction. So basically, being able to reduce or trade off derivatives, it earns us uh, enough flexibility to have to have to have a control on the on the full norm, and that's basically what makes it work. Uh, but for Navier Stokes, um, so we get this annoying extra sum for the. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So you have the Poisson equation in terms of x. How do you get estimate in space time? Oh, well. This is to reduce the space derivatives. You can just integrate everything in time again. Um, okay, and then you get t out. Well, t is, t is already here. It, it's, it doesn't affect the... Uh, but the, the way you get the h2 norm of u is bounded by... Oh, this is in x. Oh, I see, I see. I'm sorry, yeah, this, these, these are all in x and then we integrate in time. I see, I see, okay. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. So, if I correctly, the two space derivative costs you either one normal or one time derivative with, with, with these two tricks. Yeah. Um, okay, so while we have it over there. Anyway. Um, and then, so if we can. If we import the strategy for Navier Stokes, what we get is um, the norm of u being controlled by phi naught plus uh, shifted norm of f plus three sums uh, where we have well, time only derivatives hitting u grad u with the rest of the coefficients and um, time and tangential derivatives hitting u grad u and all the mixed derivatives So the reason that we split them up is because if it's if we have non-trivial mixed derivative or non-trivial normal direction, we redu we apply uh, the corresponding derivative reduction, and for time and tangential, the corresponding one. Um, so these three sums. So now uh, the main idea is to bound these three sums uh, by by a finite combination of, if I call them M1, M2, and M3, by basically phi naught uh, to some power times phi, let's say, 3 halves, plus, or t to some power, and phi square. And um, so in our to get this, what we basically do is, again, applying the brute force, we just differentiate. We apply the Leibniz rule. And with the Leibniz rule, uh, we get binomial subsums. Uh, so if I just, let me show it on M3. Uh, with, if I distribute the time derivative, 
so I already have a factorial term and then I get another sum from 0 to i where I have i choose l and continuing here so here let's just write u grad u as u tangential derivative of u plus u times normal u and then now we have uh, dti distributed over um, u and um, so let's say normal derivative of u plus the other term and now so this is in L2 space time um, and now we do have to use all their Cauchy Schwartz or some sort of fan estimate to like distribute this over the product and um, so basically again we split it in two if L is lower order then I minus L is higher order and we have an extra derivative here so we better keep this one in L2 and then use an infinity on this one if um, L is big and I minus L is small then we could try to do the other but since we have an extra derivative here we may not be able to afford an infinity space time in that case we do uh, an infinity time L4 in space and L2 L4 here and then uh, we have to end up in order to like close the estimates we have to end up in some sort of L2 norm maybe of higher orders so for that we need some Galliard and Nuremberg estimates to put everything into the L2 context again um, which are of basically one form while for an infinity space time we combine the um, interpolation inequalities with Agmon type inequality and use um, L2 oops sorry h.2 in x times u one half uh, L2 h dot homogeneous h2 plus lower order terms uh, which as you can notice gives us three more derivatives so we better be careful about where to put an infinity uh, if we have like an infinity l4 uh, we basically have like we could we can afford h dot one here so that gives only two more derivatives um and then so yes i think with the galliard estimates the rest is uh trying to close the summation which just requires uh, some combinatorial tricks to handle all the extra coefficients um and so this basically the derivative reduction estimates makes things work for the half space and then so now uh, another question would be like how we can generalize this to other boundary types or if we have a curved boundary what we can do uh, uh, well what we can do is we apply we use uh, this idea from Komatsu uh, where he uh, show the global analysis of solutions basically um, well having this like tangential and normal trick for curved boundaries may not work uh, because like basically if we, we are in a disk uh, we might have like vanishing in the interior so we need uh, more tangential derivatives and the Komatsu's idea was basically to allow more tangential derivatives as we get closer to the boundary so Basically, we do uh, need to introduce um, a different set of tangential uh, vector fields. And if we have an analytic boundary, we could actually uh, introduce analytic normal and tangential fields 
uh, which with like the total number of tangentials exceeding the space dimension. And that actually again uh, makes everything work and we have the corresponding theorem uh, the same uh, under the same assumptions on the curved boundary we still get the space time on Altista with uniform radius. Um, one thing is uh, in that case Laplacian doesn't commute with the uh, with the new tangential vector field it doesn't it does not have to so we get extra commutator sums so what is the condition that you need on the boundary to, to make this same on the boundary we need analytic data, analytic boundary like if you're not else, that's all you need uh, you don't need anything about curvature or anything like that um no if, if it's analytic and bounded bounded on all three okay i'm, I'm done sorry i'm on overtime a little bit <laughs>